Adam, dude, welcome to the show, man. It's awesome to have you on here. Uh, it's funny, we, we only connected like last year because we have a lot of the same friends. Uh, and uh, it's always good to connect with a fellow hockey player who transitioned into the real estate life, dude. For sure, brother. It's a small knit community. It's great to connect. Great to do a deal with you. Yeah. Uh, really uh, excited for the show here. Yeah. So just, I'll, I guess I'll start with that and then we'll get into your journey. So I reached out to Adam or he reached out to me. I had something in Stanford. I didn't really know what was going on over there. And um, reached out to Adam. We ended up partnering up on the deal. We made like $32,000 or something like that on this absolute dump in Stanford. And uh, he, you know, I, I kind of knew about his business partner, Bob, who's been on the show. And we had this hockey connection and he knew a lot of our friends. And it was like, and then Bob and I were down in, uh, on a vacation in Mexico, like a month later. It was, it was a small world. Everything kind of came together. So uh, it's been nice to get to know you over the last like really six months, dude. So before we get into your business, you guys are doing some great stuff up in the Northeast. Like, dude, how did you get into real estate? Like, what's your background like? Where are you from originally? Like, just catch all the listeners up to speed. Yeah, absolutely. So you uh, kind of like yourself, hockey guy, grew up playing the game, went to played in high school, played prep school, junior, getting ready to go off and play in college, get a career in a concussion. That's it for me. So a uh, couple of spiraled years out of that, from, you know, 24, uh, 21 to 25, trying to figure out my way, uh, finished up school at 24, end up saying, hey, I'm not going to go work in corporate. Uh, I want to create my own path where I can really determine my destiny and have freedom and independence, uh, but needed to figure out how do I get going and get on a path of success. So um, ended up reaching out to Bob, who I knew through Men's League at the time. You know, we had connected a couple of times. Uh, he's motherfucked me more than once or twice on the ice, both as a ref and a player. So I'm like, that's the guy I want to work for. Uh, <laughs> reached out to him, hopped on board with Reva, ran the sales floor there for two years, um, ended up getting fired from Bob which is a funny story. Uh, we ended up partnering up towards the end of that year and really going deep doing fix and flip and wholesale. So towards end of 19, 2020, we spun that and said, hey, you know, this is a business here. Uh, let's stop trying to do deals to just make money. Let's create something special. And from that point on, we've transpired and have entered into multiple states. And I've continued to grow with him. Uh, I now own a brokerage in five states. And just we've continued to try to grow with that hockey mentality of, you know, whatever it takes at the end of the day. We have it actually written on our board, whatever it fucking takes. And uh, just kind of give it to your blunt at the end of the day. You got to put in the work to get what you want. I love it, dude. That's freaking awesome. So let's unpack some of that now. So you started in the business doing some fix and flips and rentals and you're, you're, your main market is, is uh, you're, you're in, uh, what are you in Hartford? You're in the Hartford at West Hartford. Is that where you guys are based out of? We're based out of Cheshire, Connecticut. We operate the whole state of Connecticut. We do Southern and Western Massachusetts. We've just transpired back into those two areas as we were predominantly doing the nationwide stuff beforehand, Ohio, Missouri, Georgia, Arkansas, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, chasing the hedge fund game. And we realized that our long-term vision didn't exist in that space. We wanted to have more control and we figured that it's going to make more sense as a company to go deeper in our backyard. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So for the listeners listening, you know, this like, well, this is definitely something that they, they, that this will help them if they want to do the nationwide thing, just, just kind of what to expect. So you said you were actually talking offline before we hit record here. You were selling to a lot of these funds. And then for listeners who aren't like familiar with that, basically there's these large, 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 sometimes publicly traded companies who are buying single family rentals pretty much in the Sun Belt, which is the Southeast part of the United States. And uh, they need a lot of properties to buy. So there's wholesalers who can, you know, supply them deals. So just walk, walk us through like, how did it start? And then what ended up happening? Because I know you said that it started to get to where they, they started to kind of count your money and it got a little hairy. So just kind of like, how did that start? And then what ended up kind of causing that, you know, that to, to not derail, but just for it to not make that much sense for you guys anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to dive in on this. And it's important to keep in mind that when you enter these spaces, right, to just always have multiple exits on your deals. So when you're going to sell to an institutional player, whether it's a privately traded or a publicly traded hedge fund, it could be a, it could try Icon Homes, uh, American Homes for Rent, or one of the smaller guys, which is, you know, Brought Vinebrook, SFR3, keep in mind, they always want to make sure that their bottom line is being hit. They have their buy boxes. If you can't hit their buy box, they're not going to buy. They let you know, hey, we're going to go buy at 100% to par or 90% to par, but you slowly and surely realize that the goalpost is forever evolving. It's changing. It slowly moves. You send them a couple of deals that make sense. They love you. They want to continue to buy from you because you, you show prominence. Uh, you have the ability to find good deals and get them to have interest in them. But over time, 
if you're making 40K rips, what do you think the first plan of action is going to be? How do they sharpen their pencil? The more they could sharpen their pencil, whether it's their acquisition team, whether those are 1099 agents or their in-house staff, they're going to do all they can to hit their bonus. So you're going to slowly realize that over time, if you're a good player, you're going to run into them saying, hey, you know, this deal doesn't work. The vinyl planks for a 1,300 square foot home are going to cost me $1,750 to replace. Well, $1,750, geez, I can go uh, roof a house at that price. So you'll run into some questionable stuff. And over time, it's just important to know who are your players. Have more than just one or two hedge funds in your market buying, be able to sell to that local investor, be able to have the relationships with boots on the ground and other partners. Um, it's important to be able to say, hey, I have more than one exit instead of just, I hope to God this one fund buys because they'll sniff yeah. that stuff out real quick. Yeah. Being dependent. What do they say? Dan Kennedy says the worst uh, number in business is one. If you're relying on one buyer, you're out of luck. If you're relying on one deal, you're even more out of luck. So were you assigning these to them or were you doing double closing? So I know some of them are funny with assignments, like at least offer pad and stuff out here in San Diego. They like, they will not buy an assignment. It has to be a double close. So were they seeing these assignment fees or they were just, cause like, you know, wholesaling, there's many ways to skin the cat. Like what got them to start to, you know, push back a little bit? Like, were they seeing the, the, the spreads or they were just kind of like, kind of getting comfortable with you guys? Yeah, so it's very transparent when it comes to selling to the fund. They're going to want to see your original PSA. They want to see yeah. the terms and agreement to that. They want to see the assignment. They will want to know everything or else they won't move forward. Now, a lot of them claim they don't care or want to count your money, which is true. Um, that tends to be the case. But over time, you still can sense the vibrations in the water of, hey, these deals early on are not really transacting the same way. And it's just important to be conscious of that. So they do want to know everything. You can either do an assignment, which some are very assignment friendly. Some of them do not do assignments where it's a double close. It could be funded by their money. So you're still using their table funding, but you'll take a title for X amount of minutes or hours, and then it gets transacted to them. Some of these deals you actually close on with your own capital. Yeah, that's what we we do a lot of that in New York. Uh, we use the the buyer's money to fund the original A to B purchase, and um, it is a little bit more expensive, but it does keep the deals cleaner for some for some of the at least some of the times. But I remember in Jersey, like when we do stuff in Jersey, like we do double closings there, and you have to actually like I had to like show up to the fucking title company or the lawyer's office with the cashier's check, and I was like, hey assholes, like you're making me really like do this, you know, like for 10, 10 minutes, like sent the check, you know. So it's just like I feel like every state is different. You got to really know you know, the nuances and that, that can be a challenge too, for people wanting to go out of state. Let's say they're based in the Northeast and they want to start doing business down, down South. I mean, there's, there's different, different, you know, kind of style of business down there. It's a little bit slower. People are less aggressive, you know, so it probably will be easier to get sellers. Um, but yet you got, like you said, before we hit record, you got to really know the ins and outs of that market. And you got to really, like you said, be in these metro areas where there's a lot of investor saturation versus, you know, trying to do a deal in the middle of the woods in Alabama, like nobody wants that fucking property because like, it's not worth shit, right? Cause it's in the middle of nowhere. Right. I'm sure that's kind of what you guys saw, right? The more creative you will be, the more money you will see. So if you have an exit other than wholesale where it doesn't work in one of these tertiary secondary markets, say it's a backwoods Alabama, uh, market and you have a really deep uh, single family, three bed, one and a half bath, you can't sell to that fund for whichever reason it is, have that relationship with the local agent, know who the biggest wholesaler is out there, fix and flip, property management company, lender, network. And those relationships very well can actually get you an extra 10 to 15,000 if that big player decides to back out. Oftentimes, a local guy may be willing to pay more just because he knows that he needs that property in his portfolio more so than the fund who's buying 400 deals a month. So yeah. the bigger you can build your Rolodex of players, the more likely you're going to be able to succeed in simplicity when you go into these virtual markets. 100%. Because someone is always a phone call away, right? Someone's always a phone call. And that's the thing, like, when I went into Texas a couple of years ago, instead of me having to figure out the whole damn market, I had new one guy from a mastermind I was in and I would call him and be like, dude, listen, like, I'll be upfront with you. Like, I don't want to do that much work. Like, I just want to get these leads and like somewhat negotiate them. And if you could just fulfill them on the back end, like, well, like if we got to close on it, like I'll, I'll put up half the money. If we wholesale it, like just do all the work. And we made so much money together with minimal, relatively minimal. I mean, obviously I still worked hard, but like relatively minimal effort for me. I was never seeing the house. I was never getting involved in anything. I was just sending money in, getting money out. And it, it's just, you don't have to, you know, a lot of new investors and even investors who are experienced, they feel like they need to keep hundred percent of everything. I want to make all the money. I want hundred percent of everything. I don't want to fucking give up money. I don't want to do this. I don't want to pay my team that much money. And it's just such a terrible way to think. 
Like I'm, I'm thinking about ways like in my business to pay my team more money and they make great money. And I'm like, how do I get them more and more? How do I make them more money? How do I add more value to them? So just having that mindset, I see a lot of people, it holds them back because they can never grow because they're, they're, they're just trying to keep everything. They're trying to do one deal a month, two deals a month and keep everything. It's like, dude, if you did seven or five and you had a staff, like you could do so much more and you could do what you're really good at versus having to do the whole damn business and have, it's like Groundhog's Day every time you get a contract. It's like, oh, here we go. I got to go through the whole fucking merry-go-round. You guys, obviously, that's like where I want to pivot now on the show. Like, what does your team look like? Because you guys have a serious operation. You're headquartered in Connecticut, but you all are buying in mass and, you know, the, the more, uh, you know, popular states in the Northeast. So what does your kind of like departments look like in your company that make up all the, you know, uh, the deals you guys are doing? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy you hit on that because we're, you know, being hockey guys, we're really big on that locker room mentality, team camaraderie, community culture. Like you have to be a good fit in here. Uh, we just want to hire hockey guys, to be honest. It's, it's hard to find them, but we have a couple on the floor now. A guy I played in the coast. Bob's a, a played eight years pro. I played the game. So you can relate to that. It's important to have those guys because those are the buy-in, right? It's a long-term vision of having those guys on a team. And they, they never look at it as how can they be individuals? It's how can you apply and give to the greater good. So for our team, there's myself and Bob as partners. We have Ian, who's our sales manager. He played division one soccer. His brother, Alec, left commercial brokerage for six years, joined our team, played college across. There's Tom. He played 12 years in the coast, played division one hockey at AIC. We're bringing on another sales rep uh, next Monday, played college baseball. We have our TC, Tracy. We have our disposition rep, Tori, our office manager, Gina. We had right around in February, nine acquisition reps. So we had let some guys go. And here's the, the biggest thing on this is that you've heard other people talk about it. You scale really quick and you don't have the capacity to manage, train, implement, and you kind of scale a little bit too fast outside of their ability for them to now grow. Um, and the biggest challenge is we had brought on guys that we didn't have the potential to see them moving forward. So not only being not a culture fit or being potentially cancerous in the room, we're just not seeing the long-term vision of performance. We had to let them go. But before we could look at them, it was a question of, hey, what could we have done better as leaders before we point the finger? But for our team, we've, we've scaled back. We've, we've kept the right people now in the right seats. And actually, it's allowed us to do more deals with players. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. That's freaking fantastic. So on the acquisition side, are you guys doing everything over the phone or are you going out to appointments in your local area? Like, because that's a big... You know, people like to debate that all day long. We've had virtual people on the show. We've had the local people on the show. What are you guys seeing, uh, at least in your business, that, that's working, you know, at scale? Because you guys are doing a lot of properties. It's a blend. We are not fully virtual. The stuff in the states down in the Sun Belt, in Southeast, we're 100% virtual. We do yeah. not have any ground partners. So we're able to have those conversations. It's a different seller characteristic. So you tend to get a more honest, straightforward seller that wants to take their time. So as a Northeastern person, right, you're going to be really quick, right to the point, and you have to channel it back. So it's a much streamlined process. Up here in the North, you got seven people that have called the same seller, and you got four postcards and six text messages, and he's competing with everybody under the sun. So face-to-face -face interaction tends to ice the cake after a really good phone call. So we're in and out up here. We, we'd love to do more virtual, but just a lot of times that rapport is built being face to face. So it's a bit of a blend. It's a bit of a blend. Kind of depends on the deal, right? Like sometimes you can get it down on the phone, but sometimes like I always say, like we had one of my guys went or Brett went out to Delaware. He lives in Delaware, but he drove down to the house yesterday, locked it down, met them. They had questions. They were scared. They were concerned. I still have never, the seller actually said to Brett, the seller never wants to speak to me. They only want to deal with Brett directly. So I, I'm never going to be able to speak to the seller, but he drove down there. He took the hour to drive there to build the trust, obviously get the contract and develop that relationship so we can have that sale stick for whenever they want to close. And I think a lot of people overlook that. Listen, I like to buy most of my stuff virtually and it does work and it works, you know, even in New York and California. But at the end of the day, you know, on some appointments, you know, it, it to send someone down there to, to build that trust and to separate, you know, amongst the sea of competition you know, it's invaluable. It's a 10, 20, $30,000 an hour activity at the end of the day, because that's what can get you the deal over the person who's, uh, you know, calling from Kansas, who's trying to buy a house in New York. They don't even know what the market's like there, you know? Yeah, I agree. hundred percent brother. Spot on. It's, it's something that 
you know, it's just not yet replaced. You know, we're seeing it more in some of these other markets, like we discussed, but up here, you just, you got a gritty person that'll just tell it right to your face. And, you know, we've been told many times before, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and you know, you hear that from a seller and you're like, okay, wow. Uh, how do I turn this into a contract? But yeah, you're going to have to speak with that person face to face. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. So on the exit strategy side, let's get into that. So you're doing wholesales, you're doing flips. You, I know you do, you do you're, you're the section eight guy, right? You, I remember we got on the phone one time about section eight, cause I was thinking about doing it. I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, but still considering it. So what, what is your kind of like exit strategy mix up look like you know, in 2022 as of this recording? Absolutely. So we've spun off since we last talked and changing you know, our long-term focus as a company, like we talked about, we've went out of the nine states we were playing in, which was just too many markets down to the two or three we're in now, Connecticut, Mass, um, and a little bit of the New York, and we pivot in. For our exit strategies, you know, we were doing, again, pretty much any way to monetize a deal, whether it was through wholesale, wholesale, taking it to the brokerage, um, a fix and flip, novation, a rental. I mean, there's just too many exits. So we've cut that down since March. We've been selling off the majority of our rental portfolio. I still own a couple of rental properties myself, but for Perch, you know, we've scaled that back. We're down to a handful of properties. We're predominantly focusing on our hotel, uh, novations that have been great, wholesale, and we'd like to continue to go that road. Uh, leverage our brokerage that we have for those exits and really stay fine-tuned on our process and not steer off the tracks. Yeah, no, that's it's, it's especially if you want to scale, you got to keep it as simple as possible. Or else, just the operations just get get too hard to handle. So you mentioned the word novation, uh, and that is something that I've been hearing a lot. I've studied it quite a bit. Uh, I've tried to pull it off in New York a few times, and the attorneys uh, ultimately were were deal breakers on that. But you know, persistence breaks resistance. What the hell? I mean, for the person who doesn't know. What is a novation? Because that is a legit strategy where there, I mean, you can make a lot of money and help a seller out and pay more than every other Tom, Dick and Harry who's knocking on their door. What is a novation and how does it work? Because it is a little complicated. It's not like it's just very, you know, black and white, like I'm going to assign the contract and then that's it, you know? Yeah. Everybody has their own opinion on how you can describe an ovation. It's the replacement of one contract for another. So party A goes to Mr. Buyer, buyer to seller, or excuse me, buyer to seller. Uh, you contract a home. It's essentially an option, right? You have the option to buy and or list this property on the MLS and sell it to another buyer in replacement for another PSA. So it does give you the ability to exercise the MLS, gaining the ability to have multiple tractions from buyers, agents, property managers, people to see this stuff. And again, it's, it's getting out to everybody. So instead of having to hammer a phone, you have the ability to get your buyers to come to you. Again, it's a very complex transaction. I'm not a coach on it. There's much better guys out there. I know, you know, Eric Brewer does a fantastic job yeah. on, on training this stuff. He's a rock star. He but, um, it's definitely important to get educated on it before you do it. Cause there are a lot of red tape and pitfalls that can come if you do it wrong. So definitely recommend getting your education, going to a specialist and, and learning that if it's something you're looking to do. Yeah, but you can monetize a lot more of those leads because if the seller is stuck at 200 and you can, you know, get a 220 novation, now all of a sudden, or sorry, if they're stuck at 220 and your cash offer is 200, you can novate it, get the 220. And then obviously there's specific, you know, nuances with that, but ultimately you can just convert more deals and, um, you know, just make all your marketing and your business better, you know? It's uh, there are there are the caveats of having to walk the seller through the process, getting tenants on board. There there is some moving pieces, but again, and that comes down to your salesmanship and how well you can train your your acquisition squad to hit the phone. But yes, and there's a lot of opportunity there for the people that can execute professionally. Yep. Awesome, dude. That's 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 fantastic, man. You guys got a lot of ways to skin the cat up there in Connecticut. So as we start to wind the show down, you know, I want to cover one more pillar of the business that everyone's probably curious about you know, you're doing a lot of business. So they're probably asking right now before I brought it up, what are you guys doing to get leads? I mean, what's the lead gen look like for you guys? I mean, there's 10,000 ways to get leads nowadays with technology. So what have you seen to work the best, at least in the Northeast for where we're at in time in 2022? We're really fortunate. So to generate leads, the the best channel for us right now is a mix of cold calling and text. And we're privileged that 
Bob owns Riva Global. Um, for those that aren't aware, Riva Global real estate virtual assistant company. Bob's got close to about, I think, 800 plus VAs now. So he's done a fantastic job over the years of growing that. We have the call team over there, the text team, and we've seen great results, right? Uh, and that comes down to your training. That comes down to how well can these VAs communicate, articulate your process, get these right questions out, and then push over this information to whether you're using a Podio or a Salesforce to then have your team follow up. So we're fortunate to really have those channels going. We do mail as well. We've played with PPC. It's something we'd like to do more of. And then commercials is something that's in our radar. So again, I think right there, if we get mentioned like five channels, we'll hone it in two or three because you want to really look at your KPIs. What may be working in Connecticut for cold calling might not work in your market, but what's working for text messaging in another market may not work in your backyard. So it's really important to track your KPIs no matter what your lead channels are. Dude, that's such good advice because I've, you know, over the years now, as I'm saying like the last three years, texting used to be insane. And I, I, by the way, it still works like crazy for us. We use launch control. We have it literally automated, systematized. But the bottom line is that we still bring in deals every other week, at least from texting, right? And people are like, oh, texting doesn't work. Oh, it's so hard. It's like illegal, which it's not. And like, that's one of our best channels. We have right now, we have a 10 to one return on texting. I look at the numbers every single day at the end of the day, just to kind of like get a snapshot. We have a 10 to one return on texting and people, I think with the telemarketing, with the calling and texting, new investors and experienced investors, they go into these, this specific kind of telecom with the wrong expectations. They think they're going to send out a thousand texts and they're going to have three or four hot leads. And that's just not the way it works. In our business, I'll just reveal a straight up secret. I don't know there's really no secrets. The best deals we're getting from texting, it's the same shit as direct mail. When you send someone one postcard, yeah, if you send enough, you, you'll probably get a deal if you send 20,000. But our smoking, smoking, smoking hot deals from mail are coming from fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh postcard. We're doing the same fucking thing with texting. We're sending them message two, three, four, five. And this is every month, right? So we're getting people that come into the system because I'll review it from time to time. And I'll be like, holy shit, they've been in our system since November. And they've gotten the fifth follow-up message from us because in launch control, you can literally automate the whole fucking thing. And the sellers are like, oh, I've gotten eight messages. I want to sell now. And it doesn't matter where they came from. I mean, we're getting, we're putting a deal today, together today right now from texting. And it's like, it doesn't matter where they come from. It's just the fact, do they have a problem you can solve? Are, you, are they looking to get it solved now? Are they looking to get it solved in three months? Are they looking to get it solved in six months? So at the end of the day, it's about getting the traffic in the door and then determining the temperature of that lead and then letting the salesperson take it from there, depending on where they're at. But people, they throw these like texting leads away and calling these away. I'm like, there's gold here. Like it's just, it's fucking traffic generation. There's nothing more to it than getting someone to simply opt into your system. It's not like there's these unicorns out there. They're going to send 10,000 or a thousand texts and all of a sudden get a six figure wholesale. Deal. I mean, that's not normal. I mean, what do you mean? You can't make 100K in the first month of business, bro? Like, come on. I, dude, this, this guy on stage said I could do it. <laughs> dude, so many of our deals, I mean, I would say, I mean, I'm sure I'd like to hear your answer on this. 90% of our deals, if not 95, are on follow-up in some sort of fashion, whether it's like fifth call, fifth month call, two-year call. We, we've done deals where it's like we've been following up with them for three fucking years. So when they're ready to sell, who do you think they're going to sell to? When someone's been in touch with them for three years, when they're ready to sell, it, it's like they're already sold. They just haven't done it yet, right? So we get the occasional unicorn to come out of, you know, the woodworks, but that's not, especially in the Northeast, that's not normal. I mean, it's it's a nurturing game. So what are you guys seeing out on that? Like how much follow, how much does follow-up play a factor in you guys converting at a high level? Like some follow-up, not like three yeah. follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, consistency is key for both marketing and, and hammering these leads and then the fortunes and the follow-up the guy that is just you just got to have grit make the call follow up dig ask the question go for no be willing to kill the deal and if you can't kill it yeah it's a deal and if you can tie the two components of motivation and time together you're going to be able to justify price pretty damn quick now it's a matter of you taking what's yours and getting a contract signed simple as that people over complex the process it's way too complex when you talk to me it's it's very simple. If you want to sell, yes. Okay, great. When you do click sign, send back, let's have a great day, right? You don't have to go into the whole process. The more you talk, the less you sell. Dude, that's but, so freaking true, man. The, 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 more, the more you talk, the less you sell, man. And like in our business, there's like this thing where like 
at least in, in the Northeast, because I mean, a lot of people listening are in that area. They think that I think their perception of what a deal is versus what an actual deal is, is super like a lot of the gurus nationwide are like, oh yeah, you got to find this desperate person and they're in foreclosure and like, you know, they're going to lose their house and you're like the life jacket. And I'm like, yo, most of the sellers that sell us houses, and this is especially relevant in Southern California, they literally are smart. They have money. They know they're selling at a discount. They don't give a shit because they have money and they're smart. And they're simply selling for convenience. And generally, from what we see, we look at a lot of data, it's the pro- it's like they inherit the property or it's like a banged out rental or like some, there's something going on. But we bought a house last year in Westchester in a very expensive neighborhood. The guy was an ER doctor, smart, wealthy guy, calls the company up. I remember this lead because it was the weekend. I took the call myself and uh, he was so smart. And he's like, dude, I know you guys got to make money. This house. It, my dad was living there. He moved down here with me. Like, I know you guys are making, like, I'm not stupid. And, and those guys are the best. I got, I got to make, I know you got to make money on it. Like, yeah. oh, oh, correct. You're right. Well, we always say, we say to them, we're like, <laughs> how come you're not listing your house on the market? Like we, we, we kind of, we ask in a way where it's like a, like, we're not like being condescending to them, but we're like, Hey, Sal, right. I appreciate this call. You know, how come, how come you don't want to list the house on the MLS? And when they say, oh, because of X, Y, and Z, we're like, bingo, bingo. We got ourselves a deal here. So why don't you keep it? Sounds like a great property. So why don't you keep it? Why don't you put a tenant in there? Oh my God, I can't be a landlord. I'm 80 years old. <laughs> Dude, it's cognitive dissonance and psychosemantics. And if you could figure out those two psychologicals and apply it to these phone calls and just stop worrying about what you say, it's the questions and the responses you get, right? Um, guys like Marshall Silver say stimulus response. The stimulus I put out is going to determine the response I get. Choose a better oh. stimuli. Very simple. Very simple. We're not in the business of buying homes. I need to figure out what your psychological components are within the next 15 to 30 minutes. Please allow me to now buy your home. Right at the back of the room. Buy now. Sign up. <laughs> yeah, right, dude. It's such a game, bro. And it's like an ever-evolving thing. And uh, I always say to Brett, who's uh, my acquisitions guy, I'm like, you know, we won't do the same thing on every sales call, but we will follow a sales process. But one seller might want to be sold one way. But then the other seller, we have to treat them a little bit more differently. So it's like, I think the thing with sales, and I've, I actually heard this from a guy named Alex Hermosi, and it was real, real insightful. He was like, he was making a YouTube video and he goes, he's worth a hundred million dollars. So I'm going to listen to the guy. He's like, uh, he's like, I would rather go out and sell and get my teeth kicked in and then get sales training versus listen to sales training and then try to sell. Because the reason he would rather go out and sell first and kind of get beat up a little bit is because that sales training is going to resonate a lot more because he already has that somewhat experience. And that's where I see a lot of people like they, they, they hear something in theory in a book and then they try to do it and they don't have the experience to kind of connect the dots. But when they go out and they get a bunch of no's and then they ask for commitments from sellers, they're like, oh, that's why I do that. Because I used to get ghosted. And this, can we agree on a yes or a no thing actually makes sense. And then they'll have the belief and they'll buy into the whole idea and then they'll convert a lot better. Does that make sense? Yes. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Where can we, I sign? We see yeah, we, <laughs> This is by now. Uh, dude. So as we start to wind the show up, Adam, I mean, what, what's the, what's the vision look like kind of going forward for your, your real estate company up in the Northeast? Like, where would you guys, you know, like to be in the next, you know, two or three years, if you guys, you know, are, are into that kind of stuff. Some people like to do shorter term stuff. Some people like have this 10 year plan, which I fucking don't uh, confession. Uh, so where would you guys like to be, you know, in the next, uh, you know, couple of years within your real estate company? Because you guys, you guys are a heavy hitter up there. I mean, you guys are doing serious business. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you and Bob. I personally work with you guys. So you guys obviously know what you're doing. Um, so you guys got something great you're building. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, it's, it's, it comes down to t- team, dude. So even having a, a great business partner and then the community we've created, you know, we would not be where we're at if it wasn't for everyone, right? L- rising tide raises all ships. So there's no individuals on this team. And we always say, right, we walk side by side in this office and we're fortunate to have every last person in the seat they're in today. So for our company with a long-term vision, it's, you know, we want to obviously be a predominant player in the wholesale space. Uh, you're seeing guys doing a thousand plus deals a year that are in this space. Um, 
Sure, it's a nice 10-year goal to get to. For us right now, putting my humble hat on is this is going to be a growing year for us. We're, we're moving over to a, another CRM. We're going to Salesforce from Podio. We are completely transpiring from doing the virtual thing to going more regional and leveraging the states where are the brokerage is in and just trying to be the best as we can going deep, right? In 2021, we did 166 transactions. 2022, it'd be nice to be somewhere between 225 to 250. But if we don't hit it, we're not going to be too upset about it. We know this year is going to be a really big growth year from looking to bring on uh, a director of ops and other people in executive roles that we have to take a step back. So rather than say, hey, you know, we're looking to crush it and do all this, we have to look internally and where kind of the holes are in our bucket and fill those holes before we even think about going to the next level. So, um, and I'd recommend that to anybody, whether you're doing 50 deals a year, 75, uh, 100, figure out what your long-term goal is you want and you may not know until you fail at a bunch of different things kind of like what we did with whether it was rentals or biting onto too many uh, items at once too many markets too many exit strategies figure out what works figure out what fits for you long term triple down on it and invest in it today don't cut corners bite the bullet take the step back to go propel in five steps forward that will then compound and transpire to 10 to 20 to 50 that's what's going to allow you to springboard and have that radical success so you know as a company we'd like to keep going down that route and uh, continue to grow both as a wholesale business and, and grow the people on our team. I love it, dude. That's exciting stuff for you guys. Well, listen, if people want to connect with you, they want to follow you on social media or check out your, your real estate business, whether they want to JV with you, or maybe there's some people who might want to, you know, potentially work with you guys. I mean, what's the best way to connect with you and then the best website for them to find out more about your company? Absolutely. So you guys can find me at the Adam on Instagram. You can check out our companies. Our wholesale acquisition company is Pertrock Management. Uh, real estate brokerage, which is in five states, is Dorrance Realty. And then for anyone looking to get plugged in with a virtual assistant, you can reach out to Reva Global. Uh, Bob heads that up, does a fantastic job. You could check out any one of those companies. Uh, give us a holler. We're always looking to help out. We're a big fan of being partners on deals. So if there's anything we could ever do, you know, shoot me a, shoot me a message and uh, let's connect. Awesome. So the Adam Devine on Instagram. You got it. The Adam yeah. Divine. I'm not as cool as the actor. That's why I'm doing real estate. The Adam Divine. <laughs> we'll make sure we have all that in the show notes, man. I appreciate your time. That was a good one. Absolutely. Greg, appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much.